This definite integral is pretty intimidating. Not only is it an improper integral, but we're integrating the product of two infinite sums. Let's see if we can start making better sense of these infinite sums by putting them in summation notation. By convention, let's have these sums starting at n equals zero, and looking at that first sum, clearly it's alternating. It goes from positive to negative and so on, so we'll need a negative one to the n. We see each term has an odd power of x. The way we can write an odd number here is 2n plus 1, where n is a natural number, so we'll have an x to the 2n plus 1. The pattern in the denominator of this first sum is what's tricky. Basically, that pattern goes like 2, 4, 6, 8, all the way up to 2n, the product of this. And the trick here is to factor out a 2 from every single term. We would have to pull a 2 out n times. So we have a 2n times 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 all the way up to n. That's n factorial. Thus the denominator in this sum should be 2 to the n times n factorial. That second sum is similar and follows a similar trick. Here it's non-alternating, we don't have to worry about negative one to the n. We have even powers of x's, so if we're starting at n equals zero for our sum, let's just make x to the two n. That'll take care of those powers of x's, but again, what about the denominator? If we write out the pattern in the denominator, it's two squared times four squared times six squared, all the way up to two n squared. We can use the same idea as last time by factoring out a two to the n twice, or in other words, factoring out a two to the two n. And then what are we left with inside the parentheses? One squared times two squared times three squared all the way up to n squared. That's actually n factorial all squared. Now we've rewritten our integrand using summation notation after finding those tricky patterns, but we're still not any closer to actually integrating this. Maybe we can use our knowledge of power series to rewrite one of these sums as a function we know and love. Take a look at that first series and think about the power series of e to the x. If we can rearrange this, let's just leave the n factorial in the denominator, let's combine the negative one to the n over two to the n along with the x to the two n, taking out that x to the first, and we can rewrite this in terms of a power series representation of e to the x. We can take that extra x out front, and what we have is e to the x, but it's not x on the inside, it's minus x squared over two on the inside. So really this first sum is a fancy way to write x times e to the minus x squared over two. That second sum has an n factorial squared in the denominator. I don't know a great power series to take advantage of that, so we'll just leave it alone for now. Although you could try to rewrite that sum in terms of some cosine power series, or maybe even you could try integration by parts here, I think the most direct approach is to use a u substitution. That x times e to the minus x squared over two is just begging to use a substitution. So let's let u be x squared over two. That'll make du x dx, and we can substitute that into the integrand. We'll just have e to the minus u. This works out very nicely because the x dx just cancels to make du. And if we look at those limits of integration from zero to infinity, well, those are going to be the exact same limits of integration for du. When we substitute zero for x in our substitution, we get zero for u, and we can't necessarily plug in infinity, but if we let x go towards infinity, then u would also go towards infinity in our substitution. Now, thanks to that second infinite sum, we still have some x's lingering about. We'll have to change those to u if we want to integrate this. You might call this back substitution. Let's find out what x is in terms of u. In fact, here's a nice little trick. Since we have x to the 2n, let's just write that as x squared all to the n because we can rewrite our substitution in terms of x squared. Just take our substitution, multiply both sides by two, and we'll see that two u is equal to x squared. Substitute that into this infinite sum. Maybe you'd like to take a second and cancel the two to the n in the numerator with one of the two to the n's in the denominator, and we're getting a little bit closer. 
Now something that often happens with these types of problems, let's take that infinite sum and anything that doesn't have a u attached outside the definite integral. In terms of the definite integral, if there's no u, it's just a constant. Now our job is to integrate this, and if you've seen other videos on my channel, you know that this is one of my favorites. This is a different representation for the gamma function. Typically, gamma of n is represented as this definite integral we have here, just with an n minus 1 instead of a single n like we have here. So really, this definite integral equals gamma of n plus 1, which is well known to be n factorial. And we're finally able to deal with that pesky n factorial squared, since we can just cancel out an n factorial in the numerator and denominator. And you might think we're done, indeed this is a great answer, but we can do even better. Think back to how we originally rewrote that first infinite sum using the power series representation of e to the x. That's pretty similar to what we have here. Keep the n factorial in the denominator, bring the 2 to the n in the numerator, 1 to the n is simply 1, and this is exactly the power series representation of e to the x again, it's just we don't have x substituted in, we have 1 half substituted in, and this sum exactly equals e to the 1 half or the square root of e. I bet that's not the answer you were expecting looking at that first definite integral. And if you like these interesting Putnam integrals, click the video on the screen right here. I'll see you in that one.